Can you share a bit about what your mental health experience has been like as a Hispanic person? In order to understand the stories, I want to put it into context by painting a picture of my community. And the, the best way to explain it is right across the street from my house, there is a school. And that school serves children of about um, a mile to a mile and a half from that school. And that school has 21 languages being spoken. It's more than the linguistic diversity. There is a cultural, multiculturalism that is vibrant, that is expressed in my community. My community has people that are entrepreneurs, people that own landscape businesses and construction businesses, businesses that take care of the home and take care of the elders. There are uh, people in the community that are very hard workers two jobs or two parents uh, working in the household uh, and sometimes they live in uh, multi uh, generations in the home aunts and uncles living in the same home my community um, it's, it's not unusual to express uh, uh, part of ourselves in the food sharing so there's a sometimes potlucks uh, that we do at the park and recreations or at the school and in those potlucks you know it's not unusual to see somebody bringing chow mein and dumplings and somebody bringing uh, arepas tortillas pozole somebody bringing na with hummus because in my community we have people from asia from the korean community filipino uh, the uh, Hmong community. We also have people from Africa, the people from Rwanda, from Burundi, from Somalia, uh, people from India. We have people from uh, South America, including Venezuela, from Central America, Guatemala, Mexico, uh, the Caribbean, Puerto Rico. There is a lot of flavor in my community. And like I said, sometimes those potlucks is ways that we are sharing, not just the food, but sharing a little piece of our culture, a little piece of ourselves in that, and those moments. Um, my community knows the word community, whether we call it Laminga, or we call it Koinonia, or we call it the Ubuntu. You are, because I am. We're stronger together. And there's so much we can do when we're together as a community. We also share a lot of our wisdom through stories. And uh, if we listen with respect and if we listen to understand, uh, you will hear some of the most powerful stories with a lot of wisdom in them. And I say all this just to say that when you listen to this video, I am only one voice of my community. I cannot possibly represent 21 languages and culture within my community. So I invite you, I invite you to listen to all of the series that the MBA is putting together and listen for those reoccurring themes that continue to come up or those voices that echo about the needs within the community. And I challenge you, I challenge you to listen for the what. What resonates with your own story and what doesn't resonate with your own story. And not just listen for the, oh, how could that possibly be? Or that's not true, or um, we need to change that. But listen for the what resonates, what doesn't resonate, and then think about the why. Why is it different or why is it the same as your own community in your own context? So about uh, my mental health experience during the pandemic, and I am a mom of young children. And during the pandemic, my children were experiencing a lot of stress and anxiety 
and uh, some of it was because of the disruption to their routine that was very abrupt and the uncertainty happening um, and their it's stress and anxiety was shown in physiological ways sometimes with lack of sleep and also through some of their behavioral issues that surface as at the beginning of the pandemic that we had to work through but one of those sleepless nights of many at the beginning of the pandemic um, my daughter came into, you know, in the middle of the night, came into our, our room to wake us up. And uh, she said, Mommy, I'm afraid that a bad guy is going to come to our house. And rather than dismiss her at that moment and tell her, don't worry, there's no bad guy. Go back to sleep. You're okay. Um, I took the time to ask her more questions. What is making you feel that way? Oh, there's a lot of noises. Oh, are they noises of the owls and the dogs from the neighbor barking? What noises are you hearing? Um, mommy, there's a lot of sirens. Okay, so how does that sirens make you feel? What, what is it reminding you of? And through the conversation and connecting and tuning into uh, what she was trying to to express, I discovered that what was keeping her awake were sirens. I got really good at noticing, were they ambulance? Were they firefighter sirens? Were they police sirens? Were the sirens going towards our house? The sirens were going away from our house. Uh, there was a lot of noise and sirens during the day and also during the night in this point of, of the pandemic. And during this time, uh, I happened to talk to one of the police officers that go to our uh, congregation and our church, and I asked, okay, what's going on with all this noise and all these sirens? Um, can you tell me if it is something that uh, my family is going to be safe or I have to be concerned about the safety of the community? And that's when I heard for the first time, oh, Risa, we have been responding non-stop it's non-stop responding to suicidal calls domestic violence calls and disputes between uh, roommates and they are just specifically for that household so we don't think there is a community-wide safety issue but it's non-stop everywhere And that was the first time that I realized that this is what a mental health crisis sounds like in my community. It sounds like alarms and a lot of noises. This is how it looks. It looks like first responders moving quickly to uh, respond to the needs of the community. And if we focus on just the alarms and how many responses of 911 calls we receive, we might miss the point that there is a underlying mental health need that is not being addressed and there are some uh, coping skills that need to be revisited within the community to put a backdrop to what's going on uh, at this time around the presidential election right before that we had already had a tumultuous summer with the death of George Floyd uh, we have the riots in Portland, downtown Portland uh, during the summer. The DACA uh, was in the Supreme Court being uh, uncertain, with an uncertain future of what was going to happen. Then the wildfires in September happened in Oregon. There were historic wildfires um, that displaced many people, including my some of the members of my family. And all of this is happening on top of the pandemic, on top of the economic effect that the pandemic had in our community. So there was a crisis or a disaster on top of a disaster on top of a disaster. I remember during that time talking at the school to one of the moms and she was 
she was saying how she found somebody that she was able to talk to, a professional that helped her troubleshoot how ways to talk to her children and help her to reframe some of her train of thoughts into more helpful ways and learn new coping skills that were healthier. And I remember thinking, I want that. I want to be able to learn new, new, healthier coping skills and learn how to talk to my children so they can themselves uh, know how to uh, process the, the stress and the anxiety that they were going through. And, and I want that. That's when, for the first time, I encountered the barriers to accessing that help, professional help within my community. I guess it starts saying, I, I come from a culture of sacrifice. And understanding life this way has <laughs> it's, it's been incredibly detrimental for my mental health. <laughs> um, and, and, but I guess one of the reasons why I'm saying this, uh, a piece of why I'm using this concept of sacrifice, I guess, in part is because it's built into our piety uh, and, and actually has a name for it. Scholars call it Hispanic popular piety. Um, as a Latino kid, as a Hispanic, um, you know, growing up in the Hispanic culture, you grow up with symbols of sacrifice, of suffering. Um, and you see this everywhere. You see them painted on the walls of the barrio with graffiti. Um, you see them on uh, telenovelas, on Mexican soap operas. Um, you see images of cries, of, of suffering cries. Um, on, on the wall over the the above the bed uh, in, in your grandmother's bedroom um, actually my dad my dad um, he had a, a, a face of cries that was made out of clay and it had like real thorns that came out of his forehead um, very sharp. <laughs> And it was a very dramatic phase uh, with, with blood, uh, a suffering Christ uh, with a crown of thorns and, and blood, tears running down his face is, is not an unusual image. And, and so my dad had this face on top. It, just, it was just the face. And, and he had it on top of, of his dresser in, in, in his bedroom. And um, my dad would kiss Christ's suffering face every time before leaving the house. And so I'm not trying to make a thesis here of any sort about sacrifice. I'm just trying to identify how much I internalized sacrifice, suffering as, as a social mechanism to cope with, with life, to interact with others, uh, to create relationships, etc. Um, and I'm going to try to, to exp further explain this, this piece. Um, So I get part of it is I, I don't come from money, but 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 I do come from um, well, one thing. Some of the most vivid memories I have um, as a child were my mom and dad working from sunrise to sunset. And they did a little bit of everything to provide for their children. Um, they were salespersons. They started businesses. They failed. 
uh, in many of them they created something else it was just a constant grind daily grind until we grew up and, and could help in the house they literally sacrificed themselves to raise their children to give us everything we needed education well house everything so um very early in life at a very early age it was um it was in my mind it was sort of ingrained in me that that anything i wanted to do in life required sacrifices and i knew this implicitly and explicitly i i was the youngest simply and for some reason i can't explain but that meant no rights to privacy or yeah no rights to privacy at all uh, if we had visits in the house which was often um my bed was the the guest bed for instance and i would move to the couch <laughs> uh, uh, I was 26 years old. Now that I think about it, I was 26 years old when I heard for the first time this thing called personal space. I was now living here in the States and I went, um, I went to summer camp as a counselor. And part of the curriculum included a conversation about personal space and I remember thinking like what is this <laughs> these kids talk about personal <laughs> personal space what is that um saying no was never an option in my life and actually I was thought the opposite I was thought the opposite saying no was a sign of bad man um, saying yes, being available, that was what I understood as being polite, showing good manners. Those were good family values, particularly around our, our elders, uh, being available to whatever they ask of us kids, any favor, anything to, so that they could be comfortable but also like honoring their their status right in the family <laughs> but it's been until it's been a recent thing that i i'm becoming aware of how much stress and depression i've been dealing with because i grew up with with these concepts believing that sacrifice was was the only way to move forward like to to cope with things to relate to others saying yes being available like sacrificing my personal life my personal in you know, my personal space to make others feel comfortable and and yeah, it's been a recent thing that I'm becoming aware of. of how much depression, how much stress I deal with because I internalized these this, this things I learned as a kid. But it's a, it's a big misunderstanding, it's a huge misconception. The constant grind will get you through anything, even through depression. Like just, just keep hustling, keep keep at it, keep grinding until you get better. And, and it's not true. It's not true. Everyone around you ends up paying the price. Um, not having time to rest, not allowing yourself to fail, or even to say no. This word, no. Man, I've had a sleepless night 
it's grimy because because I started I'm just learning to say no to things to invitations and you know you you say no to opportunities I'm, I'm using quotes here like oh gosh what if that was the one and I missed it <laughs> Uh, what if I'm not attending this meeting and I'm not going to meet this I'm not going to be able to network or... so I'm, I'm kind of relearning I'm really relearning what it means to be healthy because I think most of what I've been doing is to conform to being functional um but I'm relearning how to be healthier and holistically aware of myself. The experience I have as a mental health um, clinician in the Hispanic community and as a Hispanic female has been challenging. Um, mental health is stigmatized. It's stigmatized in the United States, it's stigmatized in the world, and it's um, even, I feel more stigmatized in the Hispanic community. Um, having a mental illness means for us that you are loco or loca and nobody wants to be loco or loca, right? Um, in addition, nobody wants to be ill. So um, imagine that you have an illness, but that illness is a taboo and a stigma and you don't want to be like associated with it. So it's really challenging for Hispanic to look help for mental health. Um, I also believe that as a Hispanic female, we have like more challenges or more barriers as a mental health clinicians, um, as we have to prove ourselves. We have to prove that we are capable. We have to prove that um, we can talk about it. We have to be uh, good in English and we have to be great in Spanish to kind of like reach our communities. So it has been challenging. As a Hispanic man, maintaining good and stable mental health has been a challenge in this country. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico and moved to the, to the United States as a young adult. I was uh, 23 years old when I came. And I came to this country like many immigrants with goals, dreams, hopes, and expectations. But it didn't take me long to realize that in the United States, <laughs> it would be a challenging, challenging experience uh, to, to prosper and to grow here for many reasons. Number one, learning a new language and adapting to a different culture was an intense, a very, very intense experience that touched my mind, my emotions, and even my faith. I live in South Florida, and here a high percentage of the population is Hispanic, but I have to admit that I've had experiences here in which I have been treated like a second-class citizen, and that's not a good feeling, let me tell you. Many years ago, this dynamic used to intimidate me. Being underestimated for your accent or skin color is a frustrating experience that produces fear and stress. It's, it it, it uh, challenges your mental health. And if you don't learn to protect yourself, you could be hurt emotionally. Now, on this issue, I have to say that it has been necessary to fight the good fight. But after many years in this country, I have grown and learned to equip myself not, uh, not to allow any discriminatory uh, practice or trend in society to affect my mental and emotional health or even my faith. Today, uh, to this day, my friends, taking care of my mental health is one of the priorities in this season of my life. The good news is that I have discovered that it is possible, yes, it is possible to be healthy inside and out.